Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of Bitcoin Developers. I am your host, Connor Okus. Um, and in this episode, we're going to be diving back into some Lightning Development Kit stuff. Um, I've got my friend and colleague here with me, Wilma. Um, we're going to go through Anchor Outputs. But before we, we dive into all of that stuff, um, I'd like to welcome Wilma to the show because it's his first time. How you doing, man? Hey, doing pretty good. Awesome, man. First things first, um, I've got to commend you on your profile picture. That's probably like the coolest profile picture I've ever seen. Like the shades are rocking out really nice. You've got some nice backdrop there. So I've got, I've got to commend you on that. <laughs> appreciate nice look, it, appreciate it. Yeah, no worries. And um, yeah, because you're new to the show, it might be interesting for the people to learn a little bit about you. Um, we've had a whole host of different characters and people come on a show and show off their technical expertise and, and show me how to do some practical stuff on building on Bitcoin. Um, but before we do the deep dive, um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Like, how did you get into Bitcoin and what are you working on now? Sounds good. Yeah, so I got them. Well, I first heard about Bitcoin back in 2013 um, from an uncle uh i was pretty young at the time didn't really pay much attention to it kind of just dismissed it and it wasn't until late 2017 um when the bcash fork drama started happening that i heard about it again and it sort of caught my interest i was um studying computer science in college at the time so i you know i had some chops to actually dive into things technically and yeah that sort of started around like september uh so you know i also had school at, at the same time uh mm -hmm. it was consuming a lot of my free time and eventually i decided i wanted to get involved somehow so uh i, I decided to take the following semester off the spring semester um and just sort of contribute to to bitcoin in in one way or another uh so shortly after let's say uh, like around like october november ish i heard about lightning uh it was this new thing i think at the time yeah there were still it was still leclerc c lightning and lnd um but it was it was so early no one had gone on mainnet yet I believe, uh, or maybe they had. No, mm -hmm. no, I'm not remembering. <laughs> yeah, I know it was either March 2017 or March 2018. Uh, um, okay, but yeah, I decided I wanted to get involved in Lightning since it was uh, something new uh, that, that I felt I could, you know, be be of help rather than yep. trying to contribute to something like Bitcoin Core, which is somewhat mature already at that time. Um, so yeah, I sort of decided to go with L and D just because, um, it was very well documented. Um, and it, it just seemed like a friendly project. Uh, mm -hmm. there, there was, there were a few open source contributors there already. So yeah, I decided to, to, you know, dive into L and D. I started contributing, uh, over the holiday break that year in 2017 um and so going into 2018 i had you know that gap semester and i, I sort of started treating it as like a full-time job almost uh mm -hmm. i would just wake up and start you know go go on github check what issues needed uh mm -hmm. to be done and just started you know picking them up uh and yeah that eventually landed me an internship at lightning labs um mm -hmm. Over the summer, that went well. Um, ended up converting into a full time role. Uh, didn't go back to school, and yeah, I guess the rest is history. <laughs> so you're like you're like Bitcoin native through and through, pretty much, right? Like most of your 
professional career, let's say, has been revolved around Bitcoin. Is that you'd say that's accurate for the most part? Yeah, I haven't I haven't done any work with other with any other uh, cryptocurrencies, and I also haven't done any type of engineering work outside of Bitcoin so far. That's uh, that's pretty unique in and of itself, man. <laughs> um, I guess you wouldn't have it any other way, right? <laughs> you know, no regrets. All right, that's fantastic. And um, being a Bitcoin native developer, let's call you, what advice would you give to new developers or people interested in getting into Bitcoin development? Yeah, I would say um, definitely just try to get involved in open source. I think that's probably the best way to to break into this stuff. Um, I know yeah. it can seem, you know, intimidating. Uh, you de- you definitely need to have you know some idea of what you're doing. You definitely need to know how to write and read code. Reading is probably, you know, reading and understanding how a program flows is probably one of the most important things you can do as a beginner. Mm-hmm. Um, Not necessarily like the details, but understanding how things connect together. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Because I mean, I mean, Bitcoin is is full of little details, and if you try to yeah. understand all these things from the get go, it's it's overwhelming. Definitely. Um, so yeah, and that's just Bitcoin. Cool. Let let alone Lightning, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I would say start slowly. You know, go go on maybe on some of the projects that you already use as a Bitcoiner, and look for you know a lot of projects have these issues open and they're tagged uh like good beginner issue or something like that mm-hmm. um and that's you know that's a, gr- a great way to break in um and so yeah you know you can do a few of those after you feel like you know you've done enough maybe you can ramp up to a new one uh to to a more advanced one and mm-hmm. you know don't don't be afraid to ask for help a lot of these projects have communication channels that you can join and ask questions um you know, I, I've only had good experiences uh, doing that. Um, yep. People have always been very friendly and and, and helpful. Um, so yeah, awesome. All right, fantastic. Uh, shout out to Bitcoin Xavier in the chat. He's been on the show uh, twice. Thanks for joining us today. Um, all right, so let's let's dive in. I'll, I'll quickly uh, just share this window here. So we'll talk a little bit about what we're going to do today. Uh, if I share, share this one, Let's see, yeah, cool. So, um, we'll give like a quick one minute recap again on LDK, at least how you perceive it, and then we'll talk about what you're currently working on or what you've been working on, and um, what our plan is for today's today's stream. Yeah, so uh, this is maybe our fourth or fifth stream related to. The Lightning Development Kit. Do you want to explain a little bit about what it is from your perspective? Sure. Yeah. So, yeah, LDK is this relatively new uh, implementation of the Lightning Protocol. It's written in Rust. Um, and so, really, our our primary target use case for for LDK is basically integrating it into your existing application. Uh, you know, existing Lightning implementations like or or you know at least the ones that predate uh, LDK Rust Lightning they were all like a standalone thing uh, like a standalone binary that you would have to run usually in a server type of environment um, and so that's not really flexible you know sometimes you have you know maybe as like a business uh, or even just as a like a one one person development team um, you know, you have like all of this sort of existing infrastructure already, and it would be kind of painful to um, like start running these additional things uh, along with all your existing infrastructure. It'd be nicer if you could maybe have them uh, coupled up a, a, a bit more nicely. Um, yep. and so I think that's one of the main advantages. You can basically tailor fit LDK to your needs um, yep. and only use exactly what you need out of it. So for example, if you just want to sync the graph, you don't need to pull in any of the 
channel state machine code into your project. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, it's just this really useful uh, development kit uh, that yeah that you can use to to integrate Lightning into your existing application or develop a new one. Um, you know, we yeah. we provide everything that you would need um, to to spawn a, a lightning node on the network and you know t uh, you know talk to peers open channels and payments all that fun stuff exactly and um if you're interested there's a host of different projects using ldk everything from like mobile web-based wallets like mutiny to more like uh to custodial solutions and, and infrastructure based stuff as well so um it is a uh, a very flexible solution and we're seeing a variety of different projects adopt it um so let's talk about what you've been working on so you've been working on something called anchor outputs do you want to um talk talk to what that is um and i'm going to turn off my video and change to using an avatar while you do that yeah <laughs> <laughs> sounds good uh yeah so i joined the ldk team uh just over a year ago, uh, so once I started, I my my first sort of big project was to work on bringing anchor amp, anchor outputs to LDK. Uh, this was already you know ex an existing feature within the protocol for maybe two years, maybe three. Uh, a few of the other implementations had already implemented it. Uh, we were kind of on the late cycle. Uh, getting it done, uh, but yeah, you know it's it's finally here, and basically it brings a few security and UX improvements to channels. Um, right now, when you have a channel, you rely on this pre-signed transaction that will settle the balances of each party, uh, and you can basically broadcast this transaction at any point when you no longer want to you know, have this channel open. Uh, now, the issue here is that when you pre-sign a transaction, you're locking in a fee. And that fee, uh, you, you basically have to predict that fee such that it can actually confirm at the time that you plan to broadcast it. Yeah. Uh, and this is you know, a tricky problem. How can you predict things? And what what that is that fee? Future. How is that fee determined? Is it just based on current like? It's, mempool, yeah, it's based on the on the uh, current demand. Um, yeah, okay. and so because of that, you know, you have no idea what it will be in the future. Like, let's say you have this pre-sign transaction, um, and then your counterparty goes offline. Uh, you know, you can you can use it. The fee is good enough to get confirmed now, but now let's say your counterparty kind of disappeared. They never came back online because another mm -hmm. issue of this fee negotiation is that can, it can only happen if both participants are online. So let's say they drop off. You don't really know where they went. And now, you know, some time has passed and you decide, hey, well, I want to exit this channel. It's not providing mm -hmm. any use to me. Um, so, you know, you have this pre sign transaction that already has this fee. Let's call it just X for now locked in. Mm -hmm. And now at the time that you want to broadcast it, well, the fees are 10 times that. Uh, and so obviously your transaction is either not even going to enter the mempool or mm -hmm. it's not going to confirm any time soon. Um, and so if you combine this with the fact that there could be pending payments on the pre-sign transaction that you need to resolve on chain, uh, you know, this could all result to loss of funds. So it's something we we need to get, you know, that we need to get uh, correct. Um, and so, anchor outputs basically tries to get rid of this, like predicting fees in the future, mm. uh, and and sort of tries to take a more, you know, it's 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 sort of a positive but also a negative. Um, you can basically bump the transaction fee after the fact. Um, yes, okay. Using something uh, called child pays for parent. Um, this is a pretty common 
uh, way of, of bumping transaction fees these days where you know you have a transaction um, there is some change output that you control but the transaction doesn't have enough of a fee to confirm you know in, in the time frame that you want it to confirm within yeah. um, so you do you broadcast a, a transaction that spends that original transaction that you want to get confirmed and then this transaction that you're spending it with uh, basically pays fee. for yeah it has a really large fee such that it can cover the original transactions fee, yeah. uh, but also its own. And then miners will sort of be incentivized to, you know, they'll see this large fee on this one, but then they'll mm -hmm. see, oh, well, it also has this. So if I want this, I also need to mine the original one. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's okay. that's kind of the idea of, of, of anchor outputs. We attach this new output to the to this pre-signed transaction. And this allows you to, you know, add fees after the fact using that same mechanism. Okay, awesome. And just to go back one or two steps. So um, during the fee negotiation dance, is this is this something like a developer manually configures or a node operator manually configures, or is it based on like some aggregated data that is sourced from a third party or something like that. How does that actually work? Yeah, so it, it really depends on the on the node implementation. Um, yeah, okay. Most nodes out there, you know, are connected to a full node, a, a, yeah. a full Bitcoin D node, um, and so uh, the way they they get these fee estimates is just by calling into the nodes fee estimator. And this mm -hmm. is basically, you know, all of, for the most part, all of these fully validating nodes will have a mempool as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so these nodes have a, a fee estimator that kind of looks at the mempool over time, looks at the transactions that enter the mempool, how long it takes for them to confirm um, and sort of draws these estimates from, from all of that uh, data. Um, and so that is sort of used by by lightning nodes um, mm -hmm. to propose these fees. Uh, in the case of LDK, you don't necessarily need to integrate to a fully validating node. You could connect, you know, you can maybe choose to source your fees from an external party, um, yeah. maybe like mempool.space or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, there are there are risks. And doing that, you're now essentially trusting this third party to provide you reasonable estimates for you to get mm -hmm. confirmed within the time frame that you mm -hmm. that you need to. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah. So basically, each node kind of has their own idea of what it takes to get confirmed within, you know, X time frame, and they, you know, propose it to each other. Um, and if they disagree, then you know the channel gets closed eventually so it's it's not a very uh user friendly yeah yeah a, a, approach um yeah and is there any re is there any reason to not use anchor outputs is it like something that will ultimately just be the default until i know in your blog post that you've written here that i've got up on the screen um it's i don't want to call it like a workaround but it, it kind yeah, I think of is you're until something to like package, package relay. Relay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Um so package relay unfortunately doesn't get rid of so I guess up to this point we've kind of talked about all the good things about anchor outputs. Um yeah. there is one drawback and that's you need to have a, a a pool of funds available on chain so that you can actually provide this fee at the time yeah, that you want yeah. to broadcast. Um yeah. Because let's say you have pending payments that you need to resolve when you broadcast, right? If you don't have this reserve of fees that you can yep. readily spend to mm -hmm. commit to to this, you know, pre-signed transaction, and you have these pending payments there, uh, it, it's possible that you lose money. Um, Got you. Okay. So, so you definitely need to maintain this this additional reserve, and that's, you know, that can sort of complicate things. Some applications may want to, for example. Maybe they want to have their users' uh, balances all be in Lightning, 
Mm -hmm. right? Well, now there's that kind of imposes a problem here where, mm -hmm. you know, you need to maintain this separate balance on chain um, that's not really being used. And it's really just there if you ever get into the scenario where you need to close the channel unilaterally. Yeah. Um, because if you if you do choose to close it cooperatively, which you can only do when both parties are online, yeah. then you don't need this reserve at all. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You basically just sign, you know, on the latest date. Yeah. Uh, you propose the fee that you want, and you know, it's all good. good to go. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so yeah, package relay. Uh, what it does do is it uh, basically right now with now that we have anchor outputs. We still have to do this fee negotiation, but uh, you, you basically have to commit less fees up front, right? Because the idea is we're committing most of the fees at a later point. Um, so the issue is that here, without package relay, which I'll sort of get into, when you broadcast a transaction, uh, nodes typically see them as a as an independent unit, even if you broadcast, let's say, two transactions that sort of depend on each other, um, nodes will see them as as an independent unit, like each one. So let's mm -hmm. say you have transaction A and you have transaction B. B spends A, and then you give B to a node. Mm -hmm. uh, since B spends A, A is like a is a dependent, and A needs to be aware of of or or sorry or a, a node needs to be aware of that transaction A. Uh, yep. But transaction A is also unconfirmed. You know, okay. and, and it's not in this nodes mempool. So it's like, it'll basically just say, hey, I'm going to reject this transaction B mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. there's this transaction A that it depends on, and I don't know of A. Mm -hmm. um, so with yep. package relay, the idea here is that you, you, would, you would consider these packages or these transactions as a package as they are because they depend on yeah. each other and so once yeah. it sees b it'll say hey b depends on a i don't know a it's unconfirmed right because it's ideally the node is caught up to the latest block in the chain yeah. uh, and so it should know whether it, it it has a or not so it sees that it doesn't have a and it tells you know it tells the the entity that submitted this transaction b uh I don't know transaction A. Can you provide it to me? Um, and so, you know, eventually transaction A gets uh, relayed over as well. And now they can consider the whole transaction, as, you know, both transactions as a, as a package overall. Um, okay. So since we don't have package relay currently, uh, we, have, we have this additional restriction where each transaction needs to have enough of a fee or you know a, a fee large enough to enter a mempool on its own mm -hmm. with package relay this is this this isn't an issue anymore right because you know they'll see this transaction be with a lot of fees uh and they're you know they're incentivized to to get that mind yep. um so they'll ask for a and they'll get that and everything will sort of resolve itself, right? The, the okay. issue is that that logic doesn't exist currently. Yes, okay. Uh, so that's something, you know, that's uh, been in the works for, for a few years now. Okay, cool. All right, well, thanks for the, the background. Uh, very interesting. So do you want to just quickly, a minute or two, explaining what we're going to do to start trying to use it in a in an LDK node or up? up? upgrade or update an, an LDK node, specifically the LDK sample? Do you want to talk through just quickly what we're going to plan to do? Yeah, so LDK sample is, is just this little uh, sample project that we have for, you know, basically using LDK as a uh, lightning node that you could run on the network. Um, so we, you know, the anchor outputs feature came in our latest release, 116. The sample has already been updated to that, but uh, we chose not to do the anchor output uh, anchor outputs part in the sample yet. Uh, you know, for the sake of doing it sort of live on the on the live stream. Uh, so yeah, we'll be we'll basically be implementing how to open 
and accept uh, anchor outputs channels on on the sample, and also how to you know be able to provide these fees after the fact when 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 we want to close. Amazing. Okay, let me swap a few things around and uh, get set up here. Uh, if you're listening along in the chat, feel free to um, you know do this along with us. Let me get uh, my code hit up quickly. Um, Zoom out a bit. Okay. So present, share screen, and share. I'll see if I can get everything done in just my VS Code IDE today. Maybe that's a bit too wide. Let me a bit tighter and go like that. All right, cool. So um, yeah, I do have the LDK sample latest uh, latest uh, pulled locally. Um, what do I need to get going to get it up and running? Uh, yeah, so we're going to be making a series of changes to the sample. Maybe let's just do a cargo build just to make sure, you know, actually let's do git pull first just to make sure we're on the latest state. Yeah, let me make this a bit bigger, yeah. Cool, and then we can just do a cargo build and make sure there aren't any issues. All right, and we're building. Uh, yeah, so probably the first thing we'll want to do is check out the documentation. So we can go to yeah. docs.rs slash lightning okay, on a browser second, tab. Let me, let me see what browser do I actually want to use here. I will use Brave quickly. Uh, that means I've got to change my share in setup. One second. Yeah, while you do that, I'll kind of give a brief rundown yeah. of of what we'll be doing. Um, yeah. So we have the sample where we'll be, you know, writing a patch live um, to, you know, do this anchor outputs integration. And then once we're done, we're going to actually test it uh, on, you know, on, on right test. So a local test network. Uh, and yeah, we're just, we're going to spawn two nodes. We'll call them Alice and Bob. And we'll open a channel between them close it out and make sure that we actually see that spending transaction uh, be broadcast by LDK. And so once we see that, we should be good to go. Okay, what, what is this like sharing wise? Is this, uh, is this okay? Does this look all right? Yeah. Is this, yeah, it's fine. Okay, let's, let's yeah. try and run with that so I can switch in between anyway. Um, okay, cool. So run the uh, latest developer docs. Cool. So, to the so the first thing we'll want to do is is implement the the channel open for for this new feature, mm -hmm. uh, and so this is done through a config flag that we have to set. I believe it's called negotiate anchors negotiate underscore anchors. Yeah, there you go. Uh, negotiate, yeah, yeah. Negotiate mm -hmm. on this guy, yeah. So, yeah, if you read the documentation, there's a, there's a few tips. But basically, if you enable this, um, you will be uh, able to negotiate, uh, you know, channels using this feature, but mm -hmm. only for any new channels that you open. Uh, so currently, there is no way of taking your existing channel. Uh, and upgrading it to anchors. If you want to have an anchors channel, you're going to have to open a new channel uh, to do that. Oh, I there, see. Okay. Yeah, there there are some uh, proposals in you know in the protocol to mm -hmm. allow you to sort of do this upgrade without having to close a channel, but that's still okay. in the works. Uh, and you know, hopefully, we can see some progress being made towards that front this year and and, and next year. Um, okay. So yeah. Uh, 
we'll, we'll basically need to set this to true somewhere. And so if okay. we go to the code, yep. this is part code. of user config. Uh, so I guess this do a search. Uh, yeah, if you just search five. user config, something should come up. Uh, okay, let's do user config. Yeah, okay. So this is an open channel. I'm assuming it's in main Doris. Does this look uh, right? Yeah. Uh, so here, so there's, oh yeah. So basically you can provide a user config that's sort of global to the node. And so that's what's being done here. Uh, mm -hmm. You can pass it into the channel manager and the channel manager is this object that basically handles any sort of activity relating to a channel for you. Uh, you know, so okay. this, will, this will handle opening channels, um, closing them, sending payments, all these things go through this. Mm -hmm. um, so Just yeah, here my we Rust, want an to... Rust analyzer is so noisy, man. <laughs> 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 it's crazy noisy, but let's see if we can. We'll yeah, so here yeah. in user config, uh, mm -hmm. so if you go back to the docs, you'll yeah. see that this negotiate flag, if you scroll up a bit, is part of the channel handshake config. Uh, do, do, do. Okay, yep. Yeah. So we yeah, if we go back to the code, uh, we'll basically want to look for that within user config. So right after okay. line 568, Five, six, uh, it's, it, yeah, you were just saying. Um, yeah, so right there, let's do oh, yeah, there let's add go, a new yeah. line after yeah. that. Yeah. And so we're going to set that flag to true. Uh, so we want to use a config and then so it, it was a uh, channel handshake config. Yeah. And then we'll set negotiate. Yeah, there you go. Set that set that to that's a true. true. Okay. So now, nice. yeah, so this is the global user config. But yeah. the way that the sample works, it also has a config that's provided for every channel that's open. So okay. if you go okay. back to that other occurrence of user config that we that we had. This was when we opened in, in channels. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So right here, you see channel handshake config as well there on line 651. Yeah. yeah. So if we add a new line there and just set negotiate. Uh, so in here, negotiate. Mm -hmm. and so that's a true. Here. So ideally, you know, we could we could have it so that. Don't say it's a true, sorry. <laughs> yeah, true. Yeah. So we could have it to, uh, such that this open channel function all right the the method signature mm -hmm. takes in maybe an additional parameter just like it does with the announced channel that's a boolean mm -hmm. but you could have it mm -hmm. uh also accept a negotiate anchors a uh, boolean parameter but for this just for the sake of simplicity we just hard code uh, it in yeah we'll, okay. we'll hard code it in so this will only open uh anchor channels going forward okay makes sense Cool. cool. So that's pretty much it for being able to open a yeah. channel. Okay. Okay. Uh, now, another restriction we have is you need, you know, as a as a channel receiving this, or sorry, as a node receiving this open channel request, LDK has this feature of allowing you to intercept this request uh, because otherwise the channel just sort of gets. Uh, accept it automatically once it, once the request comes in. Right, got you. Oh, the okay. gives you this hook so that you know maybe oh I have too many channels open. There's this new request. You know I don't yeah. think this channel would be useful, so I'm going to reject it. Uh, so basically, so similarly similarly the case with um, like zero comp as well. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So we're yeah. We're, okay. we're using this feature as well to to require you to actually be aware that an anchor channel is being open to you. Okay. Uh, because like we touched on earlier, there is this reserve that you need to maintain per channel. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
And so, you know, ideally, so it gives you the chance to it, it gives you a, whether, yeah, yeah, to okay. enforce this reserve, right? Like, yeah, okay. if your if your reserve is below what it should be, then you yeah. should be rejecting this channel, right? Because Got you. in the in the off chance that it does have to resolve on chain, and you need to, yeah. you know, provide these fees after the fact, if you don't have enough, like we said earlier, there is a yeah. chance of losing funds. Uh, okay. So we definitely want to avoid that. Uh, and so, yes, we will need to modify the sample to do this manual acceptance for us. Okay. Uh, because it doesn't do that currently. It will just, sorry, it will just um, accept things automatically. Yeah. Automatic, so that yeah. is not incompatible. Or sorry, that is not compatible with our uh, anchor output acceptance. Okay. To do that, we'll want to go back into main, I believe. Yeah. Into that user config again. Yes. And we'll just want to set manually accept inbound channels to true. Uh, config. It's, just, it's on user config. It's on user config. OK. And then it's called manually accept inbound channels. Mm -hmm. Cool. Save that. So now that we have that to true, uh, LDK, you know, every time it sees an incoming open channel request, yeah. it will basically forward that request to you via the events API. Okay. So within the same file, I believe, is where we also handle these events. So Do we want to just touch forward, on events just a sure. little yeah. bit as well? Because it's quite an important part of LDK yeah. in general, isn't it? Um, should you like get the docs open for this or are you just gonna talk? Yeah, we can we can go to the docs quickly. Yeah, let's quickly have a look now. Uh, so here we can just in the search, we can just type event and it should come up there. Yeah. Actually, if you if you click on events before the colon colon, yeah, there. Yeah. So this is the Rust module. Uh, and this contains all things related to events. Yeah. Uh so basically, LDK has this uh, API that provides you these events on actions that you need to perform. Uh, because again, LDK is the library. You're integrating in, into your application. And it mm -hmm. doesn't want to do uh, things on your behalf that are not necessarily like Lightning related. So let's say, for example, you're trying to open this channel. Uh, for you to open this channel to another node, you need to actually send this channel request on, you know, over the network. Mm -hmm. uh, LDK is not taking care of that for you. Instead, LDK is going to give you an event. Uh, it's going to push it into this queue. You're basically like pulling this event queue, and once mm -hmm. you see an event come through, you handle it. So, you know, the application will see there's this event that says, "Hey, you need to send a message to this specific peer." Um, and so, you know, within your application, you, you just go and handle that uh, in, you know, whichever way. And what are some and, examples of, of events? Uh, so if we go back to events. Yeah, so we if we go, go I think to... you can, if you scroll down a bit. Oh, just so in the, the under enums event. Enums, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's what we want. Okay, yeah, here we go. Yeah. Uh, so there are a few here. Uh, there's funding generation ready. Yeah. This is an event that basically tells you, hey, we are ready to fund a channel transaction. Mm -hmm. Please fund it to this address. Yeah, with X amount. With X amount, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, there's... Uh, another probably quite intuitive one is maybe like, like examples. Yeah, payment quote, sent unquote, every time. Payment sent, yeah. Yeah, every time you send the payment. If it's successful, you'll get this payment sent event. Uh, yeah, payment failed example. Uh, if you find a successful payment path, so yeah, there's various various different types of events that you're required to handle. Okay, cool. So yeah. let's uh, let's go back to the code, and you want me to try and find where we're handling events here? Yeah. Yeah. So actually, if you if you go back to the docs and we search for yeah. manually accept inbound channels. Yeah. Just that it doesn't seem like this yeah. is obscure knowledge. So if yeah. you read the docs here, 
uh, it does tell you that, you know, when set to true, an open channel request event will be triggered once a request to open a new inbound channel is received. Got you. Uh, okay. So that's exactly what we need to handle here. If so this is back, when a node who potentially wants to open a channel to you. Output, uh, output based channel to you this event that you respond to give you the chance to determine whether you want to open that channel or not. Exactly. Yeah. Um, okay. It's not specific to anchors. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, a, a channel it could, could be, be zero conf as well. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But all cool. anchor channels that are inbound, right? That are. Yeah. It's a it's a new request being sent to you. Those will all need to go through this flow. Yeah. Quite. Yeah. Okay. So, that makes sense. So if we head back to the code, uh, we're looking for handle LDK events. Search handle, let me search handle, the handle event. Okay, here we go, yeah, handle LDK events. Yeah, so okay. if we scroll yeah. down here, we can search for, we should be able to find it quickly. Open channel request. Yeah, yeah, there we go. It says unreachable. We don't set manually accept inbound channels. So okay. guess what? Now we are actually setting that. And so we okay. will need to handle this. Quite, yeah. If we don't handle it, then the channel will never be accepted. Okay. And just to go back to the docs just quickly. Um, yeah. So now, request. exactly. So if we go here, there should be some docs on what we need to do. Okay. So it looks like we get some fields that we can uh, consume here. Yeah. Um, so if we look at counterparty node ID, there's yeah, a okay. blurb there that says, when responding to the request, the counterparty node ID should be passed back to the channel manager through accept inbound channel to accept the request mm -hmm. or through force close without broadcasting to reject. Uh, oh, yeah. So that's okay. exactly what we want to do here. We want to, we're, we're just going to blindly accept for now. Again, okay. in, in a, you know, production yeah. application, you would not want to do this. You yeah. need to make sure you uphold that reserve because yeah. there is a chance you lose money in the future. Yeah, uh, And we definitely want to avoid that. There, you know, this, we, we, we realize this is not uh, ideal. Mm -hmm. Anchors were, you know, the feature itself, we're still, at least within LDK, we're still considering experimental. And so we're still working on ways to improve the API around this reserve constraint. And, um, and sorry, but, just to remind myself, so that, and that reserve mm -hmm. uh, needs to be available in your on chain wallet, whatever. It yes. Is and it needs to be on chain wallet. Okay. You cannot yeah. spend unconfirmed funds. It's yes. not recommended to and, do so because you can. Yeah, it's a slippery and slope. In this to, case, I guess I we'll be issue. using. Uh, we haven't got onto it yet, but I guess we're going to be using a Bitcoin Core based wallet. But yep, because LDK doesn't ship with an on chain wallet. This could be a BDK based wallet or some other type of wallet solution. So you have quite a lot of flexibility there. But exactly, I'd imagine much of the logic for checking that reserve is going to be very similar across wallet implementations to some degree unless you're doing some crazy coin selection stuff maybe i don't know for the most part yes yeah uh maybe you just have like different uh you know reserve amounts that you're enforcing per channel yeah. based on maybe your expected payment activity or just on the risk yeah. that you're willing to take uh but for the yeah, most part, sense. you know, regardless of the amount itself, the logic of like doing this enforcement is is pretty much the same. Yeah. Yeah. Got you. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So we'll probably want to go back to the docs and see what this accept, right? Since we're just planning to blindly accept anything that comes through, right? This is just mm -hmm. a sample anyway. We don't care. Um, yeah. Let's see what it takes to actually accept an inbound channel. So it says here, uh, you know, you know, it accepts a request to open a channel after receiving an open channel request event. And so if you look at the function signature here, mm -hmm. it requires a temporary channel ID 
a counterparty node ID and a user channel ID. Now, if we go back to the request, we should, we, you know, we'll see that there is a both the temporary channel ID and the counterparty node ID. Mm -hmm. um, but there is no user channel ID mm -hmm. uh, because as the docs state, if we go back, sorry, I know we're going back and forth no, a good. bit, <laughs> but this is, no, this good. is the life of a developer. I know, right? This is this is. Um, I mean, actually enjoying this back and forth in the docs. So I kind of like this. <laughs> so here it says the user channel ID parameter will be provided back in a channel closed event to allow tracking oh, of which account. events correspond with which accept call. Okay. So, yeah, I guess not very clear from the docs, but yeah. Maybe from the name, user channel ID, this is basically an ID we're assigning to the channel, and it's coming from us, the user. So we're going to have to you know, assign this ID ourselves. We're going we're gonna to have to come up with an ID first and then assign it mm -hmm. to the channel, and that's being done by just passing it here into the, into the function call. And what do we recommend for setting, for setting this, like, be based on... It, it really just depends on, it's, it's, on the application. You could yeah, maybe have okay, a yeah. counter that you store, yeah, okay. you know, it starts at zero. And then for each inbound channel, you increment yeah. it. It, it yeah, definitely yeah. needs to be unique. Um, yeah, OK, yeah. Otherwise, okay. you know, you'll, you'll run into collisions and you'll, you know, you'll think that maybe one event is for one channel okay, and really yeah. it's for another. Yeah, um, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so I think we can go back into the code. Yeah. And let's just try calling accept inbound channel. We'll worry about the user channel ID in a second. Um, um, so let's check. Just call... Is that was that on channel manager? Yeah. Or so we, we should have a reference to the channel manager here already. I think it's just channel underscore manager. Uh, no, that's the actual thing. So channel yeah, we're, we're using the actual manager. object. Yeah. Um, and then it should be uh, accept inbound channel. Yep. Cool. Uh, Let me. Oh, it's already filled in for me. Okay. Uh, so it takes a counterparty ID, but we haven't uh, passed in the value from the open channel request, have we? These are just. Exactly. So this open channel <laughs> request, you see those two dots? That's like a Rust yeah. syntax notation for kind of ignoring all the things that are included in here. Oh, OK, cool. Uh, so here we'll want to do, uh, well, we'll basically just want to pull out the things that we need. Uh, I think if, yeah, you, okay. if you just hover over open channel request, uh, it might show you all the items that are in there. We can oh, also go to the docs and check them out. Yeah. So yeah. see it includes temporary channel ID, channel party node ID. So those are those are the only ones we want. So we can literally just type them out as verbatim as they are there, except okay. without the type information. Yeah, so just temporary channel ID, comma, channel party node ID. Cool. Uh, yeah, you, can, you can get rid of the type, sorry. So yeah. everything after the colon can go. Everything after the Oh no, that's actually the IDE um, just giving me the type by default. So I haven't actually typed that. So I've only typed. Ah, okay. type. <laughs> but yeah, why so we, we can get red? rid of that. It's giving me red because pattern does not mention fields, funding, Satoshi, push MSATs. Do I have to include those fields? As oh, well, yeah. So we, we still need to ignore the rest. So then at the very end, we'll want to do comma, dot, dot, uh, just like it was before. Ah, uh, got you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, Rust Analyzer is just very noisy in VS Code, so it, it um, kind of Oh, I can't really tell. That's like a hint. Yeah, I know. I thought it, it was yeah, actually it's a hint. Here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, it's not okay. actually me typing, so it's a little bit noisy. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, so now we have temporary channel ID. We have counterparty node ID. I believe except, channel, except inbound channel requires mm -hmm. references to these. Uh, did you see? So what we can actually do is just add a ref keyword in front of temporary channel ID. Uh, uh, at the, is that at like the a, 
Uh, Line 281. 281. Oh, sorry, not there. Yeah. There. So here, mm -hmm. ref. Uh, is it ref space or? Yeah, ref space. And then same thing yeah. for kind of party. Ref space. Okay. Okay, so I'm still getting mine that here. Mismatch types, uh, expected unit type. Found That's fine. We can worry about that. Okay, cool. it, I think it's just saying you need to uh, do a semicolon at the end. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. And now the last thing we need is the user channel ID. Uh, so for this, we're just going to generate a random one. Uh, just for the sake of this, you know, I, we could maybe have something fixed here just for the sake of, you know, the, the stream, but it's so literally just simple. hard code a number in just any number. I mean, we, we could, yeah, I don't, oh. I guess we don't plan on, uh, opening more than one channel at once. Yeah, we could, we, we could set something fixed here to whatever number you want. Um, one eleven. see. Yeah. That works. Again, you would not want to do this. You definitely want to make sure this is unique yeah. per request. Okay. Uh, cool. So that's all set. So now there's a little warning here. It says unused result. Basically, this function call returns a result that tells you whether it succeeded or not. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we can do we can just unwrap the error, which will basically panic if there's an error and kill our application. Okay. Uh, in a production application, you definitely don't want to do this. Yeah, you want to handle all You want to handle the error well. gracefully, but yeah. you know, for the sake of the stream, we'll just yeah. handle it since we don't expect to run into an error here. And okay. if we do, then we know we're doing something wrong and we should yeah. fix it. Yeah. Cool. I think the video is a bit either frozen or delayed for me. I haven't seen your change. Uh, have you not seen the unwrap? No. Okay. Maybe give it a second. Hopefully it'll come back into focus in a second. But it's been fine up to the, the, this point, but I don't know now. Let's see. Still, still nothing. Yeah, still nothing on my end. Mm. Uh, okay, let's do this. Okay, is it stopped? Uh, I've stopped sharing. Let me try and present again. How about now? Yeah. Okay, good. Now. Cool. All right, cool. Okay, so with that done, uh, we can remove that comment up there on line 282. It doesn't really yeah. matter anymore, but yeah, it's just no longer true. Uh, so yeah, with this, we are ready to you know, open and accept channels using this new anchors feature. Um, so, you know, we could, we could ship this right now, but mm -hmm. we are still missing a pretty, you know, the most important part of this, which is actually mm -hmm. uh, allowing LDK to bump the fees mm -hmm. after the fact. Um, yep. So yeah, let's, let's um, go into that. Okay. Um, so let's say we open this channel, right? We have Alice and Bob. We open this channel between them. Everything is good. They send a few payments. Uh, now Bob disappears for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. Alice wants to close the channel. Uh, right? So she's going to do that by broadcasting her pre sign transaction. Uh, LD, you know. Uh, that that request sort of needs to come from the user, so the user would do something like force close, you know, channel mm -hmm. with Bob or something like that. Yeah. Um, then that will, you know, that request will go into LDK. LDK will handle that. 
uh, and then it will give an event back to you that says, hey, you have this transaction, which is the pre-signed transaction, that you need to bump. Um, here are all the details uh, that you need to do this bumping. Uh, please you know, create that transaction, uh, sign it, broadcast it, uh, and you know, you're good to go. From the LDK yeah. point of view, you know, if this transaction that you create, sign, and broadcast doesn't have enough fees mm -hmm. right itself, then LDK will continue giving these uh, giving you these events until you actually get a transaction with a high enough fee such that it confirms. Um, and then LDK will you know stop bugging you about it. Um, and when you say LDK will keep giving you these events, is it like yeah. at some set interval? Um, there like is while your applications interval. run run mm -hmm. in or or and in addition to every time like a node is restarted, for example. Exactly. Yeah. So basically, every time a new block comes in, uh, okay, uh, you'll get a repeat of the mm -hmm. event, and then mm -hmm. I believe there's also. Uh, there's this like periodic rebroadcasting that happens. Uh, I okay. I believe every thirty seconds, but that's also customizable. Uh, okay. uh, that is through the background processor. Uh, something we won't really uh, touch here, I don't think. Mm -hmm. um, but basically, the background processor is like this utility that consumes all the different parts of your, you know, of of the. Of, of your lightning application, right? All the different mm -hmm. LDK parts puts them sort of together into one and, and kind of allows them to work together. Yeah. Um, okay. So kind of like LDK like provides you all the little pieces and then there's this background processor that puts all these pieces together like a puzzle. Go ahead. Uh, so yeah, we'll need to handle this event. And this event is called the bump transaction event. So this event is also something new that came in 116. It was added specifically for this feature. Uh, Look at me, man. I... I'm going to the docs without you even having to ask me, man. <laughs> uh, bump transaction event. There you go. Okay. Oh, actually, can we go? Let's go back to events. OK. Uh, and then let's go to the event enum. Yeah, and so here there is, you know, a variant for the enum that's bump transaction. So if you look on the sidebar, it's actually the first one there on the left. Oh yeah, okay. Just click that. Yeah. So as the docs read here, in the case that a transaction originating from LDK needs to have its fee bumped, right. uh, this event requires confirmed external funds to be readily available to spend. Wait, so it determines it needs a fee bump. Based on based on current... the current transaction fees, yes. Right. Because right. Remember, we said that with anchors, we want to contribute the fees at a later point yeah. in time, yeah. right? Well, that mm -hmm. later point in time is actually now, or rather, okay. when you okay. receive the event. You know, that's that's when you're actually contributing the fees. So this is when you need all that reserve enforcement that you've been doing all along. This is when it actually mm -hmm. gets used. Go ahead. Go ahead. So as it says here as well, it will not generate this unless negotiate anchors zero fee is set to true. So if you never if set this to true, it. you can just ignore this event. You'll yeah. never receive it. Got but it. If, if it is true and you have opened channels that have anchor outputs, then you will receive this event once they close. So the channel right. has to close first in order for you to receive this event, right? Because it's, and it has to close through a forced close or unilateral close. Same, mm -hmm. you know, they mean the same mm -hmm. thing. It's just basically mm -hmm. using the pre-signed transaction uh, that you, you know, pre-signed with your counterparty while they were online, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. using that and going, you know, broadcasting that and acting on that. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, let's. Um, Let's uh, handle this. So actually, so you could choose to handle this on your own. Okay. 
but uh, from a usability uh, point of view, we realized that there's a lot going on here, and we kind of want to make this as simple as possible for the user in yeah. order to integrate. So we added a utility object that you could use that actually consumes these events for you. Okay. Uh, and then all you need to do is kind of provide a view of your wallet to LDK, right? Because LDK needs these external funds. It needs access to them so that it can, you know, allocate them towards a transaction, sign mm -hmm. them, and broadcast. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you look up the uh, bump transaction event handler, could maybe open a new tab for this one since we might be going back and forth a bit. Yeah, okay. Um, so this is the bump transaction event handler. Yeah. yeah. So it's a handler for handling uh, bump transaction events, mm -hmm. event sources, confirmed UTXOs from a coin selection source to fee bump transactions via CPFP mm -hmm. uh, or replaced by fee. So we haven't really touched on replaced by fee, um, but basically it's just, you know, you, you sign the transaction, it has a low fee. Uh, you can re-sign that transaction, or rather you can allocate a higher fee to the transaction, re-sign it mm -hmm. and rebroadcast it. Um, and that will basically be like a new transaction. Um, but since it's spending the same inputs as the original transaction was, uh, you know, in Bitcoin, we cannot have double spends. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the new higher fee transaction is kind of replacing the old one. Quite um, yeah. Simplified explanation of it. <laughs> yep. There's a, there's sense. still a good bit that that goes into that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, this uh, if we look at this bump transaction event handler, there are a few things we need to provide in here. So there's a broadcaster interface, which is basically just something that broadcasts transactions to the network. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There is a signer provider. This is um, deriving. Uh, signing key material. So these are like deriving private keys mm -hmm. that you're going to use to sign the transaction. Um, there's your, there's two types of signing that will happen in, in these transactions. There's the signing of the external funds. So that's coming yep. from the from the user, from their, from their wallet. Uh, mm -hmm. And there's signing within LDK as well for the UTXOs that are coming from the channel. So yes, the channel okay. has outputs, right? Or, or like this pre-signed transaction that closes the channel. It has some outputs, right? And yeah. one of those outputs is the anchor output. And so, you know, every output that is spendable, uh, for you to actually spend it and, and it to be validated on, on the blockchain, it needs to be signed. So mm -hmm. that signature is coming from this signer that we are obtaining via the signer provider. Okay. The name's kind of work out here <laughs> <laughs> uh and then we have okay. a logger um which you know, when has things a name go bad. it's just logging things <laughs> uh so the good thing is we actually have three of these things already so that we have the broadcaster we have the signer provider and we have the logger uh these all exist within the sample already so we don't need to worry about them we don't have okay. this coin selection source so so that is something okay. new and we do need to implement this. So that is our next step. OK. Um, so here, if we go to coin selection source. Oops, jump the gun. Cool. Um, yeah, so as a docs read, an abstraction over a Bitcoin wallet that can perform coin selection over a set of UTXOs and can sign for them. Uh, the coin selection method aims to mimic Bitcoin Core's fund raw transaction. So if anyone has used that RPC before, it's it's, it's a bit similar. Okay. Um, and most wallets have something like that. 
if you yeah. don't have something like that, uh, or you you know you find that this is not worth implementing, uh, or it's too tricky, or you know whatever reason you have, there is an alternative wallet source uh, trait that you can implement. And then if you implement that, you pass it into this kind of like wrapper object, and that will implement coin selection source for you. Okay. Uh, and so wallet source is like the most basic view you can have of a wallet. Uh, so it's basically just give me all the UTXOs that you have that are confirmed, give me a change address, and sign this transaction for me. Uh, this is th these are kind of like the three basic things that every wallet should have. Maybe add a fourth one, like you know, give me a receiving address. Uh, but you know, we don't we don't need that for this case. Uh, so yeah, we we basically just need to implement these three methods. We hand it over to this wallet object uh, that is highlighted yellow there. Um, in the in the documentation, uh, and then we pass that into the bump event handler, and we should be good to go. Okay, so, that seems pretty straightforward. All right. Yeah. So let's um, let's work on that. So we'll want to go to uh, which file is it? Bitcoin D client. Oh, I think, yeah, the uh, screen is frozen again. It's frozen again? The sharing. Hmm. Let's just reload quickly. Uh, very strange. I don't know why that happens. Um, how about now? Are we, yeah. Are we move it. We are okay. Good. Okay. Um, how do you feel we're doing on time? Time-wise, mark. Yeah, so I reckon we've got about twenty minutes left, twenty-five minutes max. Okay, let's um get into copy and paste mode. <laughs> yeah, let's, uh, I'll share this with you. We'll okay. just sort of go over it quickly. Yeah. Uh, I will send it over Discord because I can't share it over StreamYard. All right, cool. it's too awesome. it's too big. So you might want to disable your okay. your uh, presentation before you switch yeah, over. Okay. Yeah, I've got two screens anyway, but yeah, just to okay. make sure anyway. Okay, so once you copy that, you can just paste yeah. it at the very end of that Bitcoin D client file. Okay, give me a second. Um, let's see here. Okay. It's a stream yard. All right, can you, you can see my, uh, Screen, yeah. yeah. So at the end of this file, or at the end of the yeah, end of the file, you can scroll all the way down. File, yeah. Okay. Okay. Let me scroll up. Okay. Cool. So we have a few compiler errors here. I think most of these you can just right click and quick fix. Yeah. Import. Just import like all of these. Yeah, I should be able to do import all. How do I do import all? I can't remember. Import out. Oops. Paste. 
Uh, we want the Do we want the Bitcoin output. Chain. Bitcoin output. Oh, we want Bitcoin output. What is it using? Uh, okay, it's called. Yeah, I don't think it actually imported it yet. Did it not? So we want, is it this one? Chain transaction output? No, it's, it's just Bitcoin colon colon a point. Oh, this yeah, one. that one right oh, there. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Just that add it at the very top. Yeah, that one didn't auto import for some reason, but anyway. Okay. And then I think we're missing from slice and consensus. Yeah, consensus and code. That one we're going to add ourselves. So that one. That one's fine. This one we're going to add ourselves. Yep. From slice. Is it from Bitcoin hashes? It should be, yes. Should be. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and then, and then consensus, consensus decode. And code. And code. Okay. Cool. So okay. So okay. let's go over this before we quickly, and then we'll, we'll get to list and spent. Okay. So list confirmed UTXOs. Sort of as the name states, you're just calling into your wallet and you're going to return all confirmed UTXOs. This means any UTXO which at least has one confirmation in the chain that you can spend. If it's spent, we don't want that. Right? That's what the U sp uh, stands for in UTXO. It's, uh, unspent mm -hmm. transaction output. Mm -hmm. So uh yeah we're, we're basically just calling into the bitcoin core wallet through list on spent they're on line 320 yeah and that's giving us a result and then we are just providing some additional information on this output or, or rather mm -hmm. on these utxos mm -hmm. uh basically ldk will need to know what type of utxo this is uh Meaning, is it using SegWit v0? Is it using SegWit v1? Is it pre-SegWit? Um, these things matter for fee estimation. So, you know, this basically allows LTK to allocate the exact fee it needs um, to, to, you know, give you the higher the, the highest chances of, of actually confirming. Cool. Um, so and this, it is, has this is a pretty be, important aspect. Has to be you don't want to get that wrong. And they, they have to be segwit outputs by default, right? Uh, no, we're oh. actually flexible no. here. It can be. Oh, uh, okay. It can be any output. Okay. Okay. Um, but here we are, you know, for for the sake of the live stream, we're we'll only be dealing with segwit v zero. Yeah. Uh, okay. And so that you know we're only handling those here. Okay. Um. So you you know, I, ideally you have like a way of determining the UTXOs. Mm -hmm. Um. Mm -hmm. Type and then you can map that into what LDK requires. Okay. Uh, cool. So we can sort of move on from that. There's a lot of boilerplate there. You don't really need to worry about. We'll have mm -hmm. all these changes will go up as a pull request as well, so you can see like the final nice. thing. Um. So so yeah. Nice. Uh. So next one is get change script. Basically, anytime you do coin selection, right? If you want to fund. A transaction and you do coin selection you might have change right you're not always going to spend exactly all of the coins mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we need this change address um to you know store that change back mm -hmm. and you know mm -hmm. give it back to the user That's it's, 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 probably, it's probably rarely the case that you'll set you'll spend the exact amount anyway right exactly like most scenarios I mean. yeah there are some coin selection algorithms that optimize for yeah. that. Yeah. Um, but yeah. 
Okay. So then, yeah, that's pretty much it. And then we have sign TX, which is also pretty straightforward. You basically mm -hmm. just give your wallet the transaction, and then the mm -hmm. wallet should, you know, be able to look at all of the inputs in that transaction and determine which one belong to it. Mm -hmm. And if it does belong to it, then it should sign for it. And in this case, um, because it's using Bitcoin D, it's using like uh, the, the sign rule transaction with wallet RPC command. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that RPC requires you to provide the transaction as bytes. Okay. Um, yeah. Not like as an object, just like raw bytes in hex, hex encoded. So, yeah, but, you know, that's yeah. all the code that's happening up there. And yeah, then it gives yeah. it back to you in hex as well. But we need yeah. to, you know, decode that to satisfy the the function signature, which wants an actual like, transaction object. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so yeah, I mean that's that's pretty much it. Okay. Um, doesn't seem too bad. No, that's that's pretty good. That's pretty good. So and here we're... as well is like like mm -hmm. um in th this sign transaction this get change like it's very flexible depending on like what your wallet implementation is again right like exactly because yeah. we already have a bitcoin d client in the sample we're just using that but it could, again yeah. like be you BDK have this, or be anything whatever, you want like, yeah. as long as it satisfies you know like the interface yeah exactly okay cool cool so now we still have that compiler error on list unspent and so yeah. I want to fix that. So I will send that. This one's a short one. I'll send that to you on the okay. board as well. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. So, um... and then we'll want to paste that. Look for get blockchain info in this file. Oh, I think the stream froze again. Uh, so I'm not idea what it's happening, but no worries. We will just reload again. Um, okay, so get blockchain info. Uh, we're looking for the definition. So let's ah, keep. Okay. So we want to get no, it, it should be all lowercase. Or like a get underscore blockchain underscore. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay. There you go. Oh, there we go. We'll just okay. want to add it right after. Yep. We will. One too many. I think we yep. need okay. a few more things. List unspent response. We have, don't have that defined anyway yet, do we? I don't think so. Uh, so I will, I will give that to you as well. Give me one second. It's over on Discord. Yeah. Oops. Uh, public shots. Okay. And this will go at the end of the convert RS file. Um, what is this doing? Okay, this is just defining some structs. Yeah, this is just some Define. some boilerplate code. It's basically mapping the JSON because the uh, Bitcoin okay, Core yeah. RPC uses JSON for yeah, requests and responses. So it's just yeah. mapping the JSON into uh, into this structured object that we can use. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's just it's just uh, a translation. Nothing really interesting happening here. 
Uh, this one will want try. the first one, Bitcoin address. I guess so, both are fine, but. Okay. And what is the other one? From string. Yeah. From string. Yeah. Right, that should do it. So now if we go cool. into Bitcoin D client, we can resolve that list unspent now. There you go. Okay. So now that we have this wallet source implementation, right? Which is, if you scroll down, that's what we implemented on Bitcoin yep. D client. So that's Bitcoin right. D client and is our wallet source. Yeah, yeah. We need to yeah. provide this to the bump event handler. So now we'll go into main. Yep. And we'll want to define the bump event handler somewhere. Where it happens, Do it. it doesn't really matter. Straight after this uh, open channel request. Um, let's, no, so we'll, we'll actually want to go where we are defining things, like initializing okay. things. Okay. Let me get you. Okay, so online, like 560 around there, like right after the channel manager. Uh, scroll down a little. 560. Or, yeah, right here, right below this. Okay. Um, okay. And this so, is what, what are we defining here? Yeah, we're initializing our bump event handler. Ah, uh, bump event handler, okay. So this will be like, so we'll do let. I guess maybe I can just give you the code here too, just to leave it for you. Yeah, just in the interest of uh, time, for about yeah. five, five minutes. Yeah, to doing the actual demo. Yep. We're almost there. Yeah. It's been, uh, been very good. I've enjoyed this one. Okay. So we could bump, and this takes in a broadcaster. Oh, okay. So I remember reading this from the docs now. It takes a broadcaster. It takes mm -hmm. a, a wallet. Wallet. So it takes a wallet Your source. Clients. Yeah, a wallet source. And then Which like, is our Bitcoin D client. Sign a provider. Yeah, the keys see. manager and then the logger. Okay. Yep. Cool. Cool. So that's ready to go. Now we need to. Oh, we need to. Uh, yeah, add some imports here. Okay, looks good. Oh, we'll need to add this line. I sent. I sent this one over the yard chat. Okay. Uh... Bump transaction event handler, and that takes the bump transaction event handler that we just defined. Okay. Yeah, so we're just getting a, a reference to that handler. And we're going to add it. If you look for handle LDK events, yeah. Uh, Let's do, let's go to the other one. Uh, this one. Yeah, so let's add it just like right above async move. You can add it right there. Mm -hmm. And now we can add bump TX event handler inside of this handle LTK event. Let's just add it at the top. Uh, sorry, say that again. So, so go to line 802. E802, yep. Add a new line and then just pass in 
a reference reference to... bump tx event handler yep and now go to the definition of ldk events handle ldk events and as the first argument we're going to require that bump transaction event handler um, I'm just going to it. Uh, okay get her, get her pilot she seemed to help me there is that the correct is it it's of type well, transaction event handler. Yeah, that yeah. should work. Except I think we need to give it all the generics, but maybe we don't. Maybe it's fine. Uh, okay, I think. Oh, now the last thing is we actually need to use this bump mm -hmm. transaction event handler. So now that we have it, cool. yeah, that's fine. Uh... we're going to use it now. So let's scroll down. Missing, ah, oh, yeah, you're right. Oh, missing, missing generics, generics. Sure. yeah. Okay, these are kind of. <laughs> this goes a lot. bit hairy. I will. Yeah. yeah. I'll send these to you as well. Nice. Ah, okay. Okay, we're almost, almost there. To over StreamYard again as well. Yeah, so Basically, just replace bump transaction event handler as you see it there with what I've given you. Yeah. Uh, I think you might have maybe delete. Yeah. Okay. So delete the uh, delete one of the closing there? arrows and delete the comma before. Okay, I think. Oh no, actually, I think you need one more. I think you need one more closing arrow. Sorry. Uh, here. Then, yeah. yeah. Uh. Oh. Wait. Oh, sorry. So, oh, I gave you the wrong one. Sorry. So, uh, in Bitcoin D client. Let's go back. Hold on. Oh no, no, no yeah. that's fine. That's fine. You can go back. We'll just uh, change it. That is... Just do undo. Yeah. So in Bitcoin D client. Um... Bitcoin D client. Oh, no, no, sorry. You can stay, go back. I'll stay here. Okay. Actually, I'll, I'll write it and then give it to you. Okay. Okay, I believe this should be the right one, though. Let's see. Um, so I need to replace everything up to here, I think. Yeah, and then add one more arrow, I believe. One more. Yeah, and then remove that comma. Uh, like right there, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh... Oh, sorry. Do arc Bitcoin D client. Sorry. So the the second, yeah, that one on Bitcoin yeah. D client. Yeah. Uh, uh, instead of instead of wallet or go one space um... over. Yeah, and now do. Arc, arc, and then oh, the angled, yeah, and then close it after Bitcoin decline. Okay, cool. Okay, nice. All right, we're good to go now. <laughs> so nice. now, um, we'll score all the way down. Uh, we're looking for bump transaction event because we can uh, finally handle that now that we have all the. Required event. Do we have that? I think it's at the very end. You can keep scrolling. At the very end, expendable output channel close. There you go. Yeah. Okay. There we go. So we want to. We don't 
we can just replace that underscore with like an E. What does that do? Does that just give you the underscore ignores? The ignores, thing. okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then we want to handle this. Yeah, so exactly what is being proposed there is what we want. And I think we just need to give it a reference. All right. So now if we nice. cargo build, we should be in a good state. All right, moment of truth. <laughs> good timing as well. I've actually really enjoyed navigating through the docs on this and coming back to the sample. It's when you, I think, think about ODK, when you know the flows of things, it's okay. It's actually okay. It's actually like understanding how things tie together and eventually need to handle when this happens and when that happens. But like much of the code, I wouldn't say is like terribly complex. I wouldn't, mm -hmm. say, I wouldn't say that. Um, okay, cool. So, so uh, compiled. <laughs> yeah, we're ready for the demo. If you think we can do it, yeah, let's give it a go. Okay, let's so we'll want go. to first start Bitcoin D. Yeah, so um, I need to go into the Bitcoin directory and then I need to run on I've got an alias which is BTC start. Uh, Bitcoin Core is probably already running. Oh, is it? Um, let's see. Uh, make this a bit bigger. So, uh, I want to go BTC source and BTC start. Seems like it's already running. Maybe I didn't turn it off yeah. before. So, if I do BR. Uh, help. help. Let's see. Okay, it's already okay. running. Cool. So let's. I think the first thing we need to do is create a wallet, probably. Yeah. Uh, so what is that? Do BR create wallet, and then just give it a name. Test. Cool. And now we're going to generate a new address. So do BR generate new address space. Uh, Back 32, so B E C H 32. Uh, do I need to? Do... Oh, I think it's get, sorry. It's get new address. Yeah, get new address, yeah. Oh, actually, before you do. Oh. Before you do that, I think the label goes first. So it might have interpreted that as the label. Yeah, so let's do. Let's generate another one, and we're going to use this one that we generate. So do the command again. Just go up. And then yeah, yeah do empty quotes. Yeah, and now do uh, batch 32. Oops. Block's given us security warnings. Um, I thought it generated it by batch 32 by default anyway, to be honest. It depends but... on the version. I think they started doing Taproot now. Uh, okay. But maybe not on the version uh, that you are. Okay. Okay, okay. I'm not cool. sure. So this is the address that we're going to mine blocks to. So we'll want to copy this. Yeah. And now we'll do BR generate to address. Um, uh, 101, yeah. And then paste. That should mine some blocks. For those curious, we're doing 101 because of the Coinbase um, reward. reward. The reward yeah. is given to you after 100 blocks. Yeah, so if we check our balance now, I guess, just to make sure yep. that we should have works. 50 coins. Cool. So now we can start our Alice and Bob nodes. Uh, yeah, let's, uh, let me just do this and split. Fashion. So I'm gonna um, I'll get two panes up here. Oops. Okay. 
So uh, we want to have a lightning node running one Alice, one Bob. I think we. Yeah. Uh, if you in in the streamyard chat, you should see the. Oh yeah, of course. You so this should work now since we figured out those issues. Yeah. All right, cool. So one is. Uh, what did it? Oops, copied too much. Oh yeah, we just need yeah. from cargo. From cargo. Um, okay, we can deny. Or yeah, it's fine too. <laughs> um, all right, so that's just uh, the samples running now. Nodes running, local ID, and it's printed the local ID for Alice. Yep. Or this I'll node. Do the same and for then, Bob. Let me just copy this one. And do the same for Bob. Cool. So we've got two nodes running. Yep. So now we'll want to open a channel. So if you if we type help, let's open it from Alice to Bob. Okay. So if we type help, we can see the syntax here for open channel. So it's open channel at pub key or pub key at host port amount. Okay, pretty straightforward. So let's go ahead and do that. So maybe I can. Oh, I can't type it for you because you need to copy the node ID. Yeah, so it'd be but not this one, you need bobs. Yeah, so open channel so it take pub key and the host and I'll, I'll give you the format. So um, open channel. Open channel. No. Space, copy the Space. node ID. It has a period, so delete that. At localhost colon nine seven three six. And then space amount will do one million. Yeah. Is that one million or is it a hundred thousand? Uh, it's a hundred. Yep. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. One, so yeah, these yeah. are one million sats. Uh and yeah, that if we just press that enter, should that should good. that should work. All right, so we see that we have a channel. Um Awaiting funding lock in. So the channel has actually been funded already. So if we go back mm -hmm. to our Bitcoin node, maybe open a new tab here. Yeah, let me. The, let's go. Let's do it. Let me see vertically. Mm, it's a bit awkward, but whatever. Um, so uh, BR, get balance. Is that what you wanted to do? Uh, no. So we'll do get yeah. mempool. Info, I believe. Oh, I need, hold on. Um, you need to, need to go see into resource. Yeah. And then um, get, sorry, get mempool. Yeah. I think. Uh, what was it? Get mempool info, is it? Yeah. I think this yeah. will just give you the info, though. Okay, yeah. we need get raw mempool. Yeah. But we see that we have one transaction in there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, raw and then no info. no info. Cool. So if we, yeah, so this is our, this is the TX ID of our funding transaction. Yeah. Uh, we can go ahead and mine this. So let's just generate one block. Uh, Same command as before. What's it again? Um, generate to. Yeah, the only thing is you don't have that address anymore. Mm. Oh, yeah. That's annoying. Um, or do I? No, I don't. Uh, you can generate a new one. Sure. Just do the same thing. So BR get new address. And then do the label thing again, like empty quotes. You did BE instead Oops. of BR. Oh, B -E -B -R. Okay. Cool. So we and just need to generate. We'll generate. Let's generate, generate, generate six blocks. Generate two address, six blocks. Okay. So now it says that our channel is ready to be used. Um, nice. So now if we do list channels 
on Alice. We should see one channel here. If we scroll up, perfect. So there's that TXID that we saw from earlier. Yep. Um, cool. So now, uh, the you know, for the moment of truth, mm -hmm. we're actually mm -hmm. testing. We're, we're going to get to test the anchor code now. Mm -hmm. So we're going to force close this channel because, again, anchor outputs only are relevant in a force close. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you go to help, we'll see the syntax for how you force close a channel. Uh, this should be see. yeah. So it's a force close, close channel, channel ID. We don't force close, not close. Oh, sorry. So yeah. Channel ID close. and peer pub key. So let's first copy the channel ID. If you scroll up a little, it was in that list channels output. There you go. There we go. It's yep. going to paste so now... it over here so I have it. OK, so we can call a uh, force. Force close. Force close channel, is it? Force close mm -hmm. channel. I paste the channel ID. And then the second one was what was the? The node ID, which you can just get the from the bottom terminal. You can just copy it from there. Yeah. Yeah. Just remember it has that period there again. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So initi initiating channel force close. And so now if we go into, uh, if we check the mempool again, if we do get raw mempool, assuming everything worked correctly, we should have two transactions. So one, I would assume the top one is going to be mm -hmm. your pre sign transaction, right? Yep. Which would have a very low fee, just enough for it to enter the mempool on its own. Yep. And then there's the child transaction, mm -hmm. uh, which is this 560D. That mm -hmm. is what's contributing most of the fees and fee bumping that parent transaction. Um, got you. OK. And then we've got this message here. Uh, this is support, yeah. This is not really an issue. Uh, this is just like so. Remember how you asked earlier, like how often this like will LDK like give uh, you these yeah. events? Yeah, uh, yeah. It's hitting that thirty second timer right now. Oh, I see. Okay, got you. Okay. Um. So yeah, I I think we're pretty much set here. So we could confirm that, and then the channel would get closed. Okay. So we, we can do a little bit of introspection here to, to just to make sure that these are the transactions. Um, oh, someone did you know, ask a message, leave it. Sorry, someone did uh, ask a question earlier. What is the BR command I'm using? It's just um, a alias, so I don't have to type out Bitcoin CLI dash reg test dash the command every time I want to make an RPC call. So it's just my own... Um, aliases so it's nothing bitcoin specific or anything um sorry so last bit is you said uh then we can just mine the transaction the latest yeah. transaction mm -hmm. yeah. so we um, just generate six blocks again uh, uh, i need another address uh, uh, uh you might just be able to scroll up and go to the history yeah look if you just scroll up uh, all, until you see that command uh, oh, I didn't um, clear the term. Yeah. Oh, I can just do this. Yeah, I can just do this. I guess. Yeah, can we do this? Ben, generate yep, yep. to address. Yeah, we can do that. Cool. And yeah, now the channel should be closed. Um, I don't think LDK sample has a way of viewing closed channels. But uh, if it did, then let's just double check though. Yeah, if we do list channels though, it shouldn't show yeah, up. Yeah, let's try. Yeah, list yeah. Yeah, and okay. then if we do it on Bob, just to make sure, it shouldn't show yeah. up there either. Yeah, so now the channel's nice. closed. Uh, nice. It's confirmed. LDK is not going to give you these events for this specific channel anymore since it's closed and confirmed. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, we are good to go. Fantastic, man. That has um, got to be the smoothest tutorial I've ever done on this channel, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's it. We're, we're pretty much done, aren't we? That's, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Yeah, we could do some transaction introspection. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, if, if for the sake of time you want to cut it short, that's yeah. okay too.
Yeah, let's uh let's cut it there. So let me uh stop sharing. Wow, all right. Well, Wilma, that was um that was fantastic. Good job on getting this uh, getting this in, getting this done. I know you've been working hard on this for, for a little minute now, so uh well done on getting this in. Um we will be releasing this replay. Um yeah, I know very, very, very good tutorial today. Fantastic. Arguably the best one really showed us how to navigate the docs, how to understand the flow of how LDK works. I think that is somewhere people are challenged the most. It's not necessarily the implementations of all the interfaces and APIs, it's just understanding how things connect together. So we'll continue to try and do our best at uh, creating videos and writing documentation, documentation to make sure all of that's as clear as possible. And um, I was going to say one other thing, um, but it slipped my mind, but no problem. Um, but well, yeah, Wilma, I want to thank you again for, for joining. Oh, yes, I was going to say. So yeah, the, we'll be doing a replay, uploading a replay to YouTube early next week. Um, we do plan to doing like a condensed version as well. That's maybe like 10, 15 minutes where like Wilma will just literally um, go into the practical of how to how to add anchor outputs to the LDK sample without me asking the silly questions in between, basically, um, mm -hmm. for people who want to dive in straight away. So look out for that as well. Um, Wilma, do you want to leave people with any kind of last words before we go? Sure, yeah. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is still an experimental feature, so we are definitely mm -hmm. looking for you know, any feedback um, or concerns that you may have, uh, you know, how we can improve things and whatnot. Um, so yeah, just feel free to reach out, uh, just message the Discord, uh, you know, where someone's always there uh, answering questions and providing feedback. So yep. yeah. Sounds good, man. All right. Well, thanks for joining me again today. Thanks to everyone who listened in and we'll catch you on the next stream. Peace. See ya.